welcome everybody because this is now both the closing keynote lecture for our two-day conference languages of the anthropocene and the british school at rome's weekly public lecture and i'm delighted to welcome you all also on behalf of the organizers of the conference which was jointly hosted by the british school at rome ucl college, uh, university college london the uh, universities of Roma Tre and Sapienza in Rome and the University of Heidelberg's Kete Hamburger Center for Apocalyptic and Post-Apocalyptic Studies. It's a really great pleasure for me to welcome our keynote speaker tonight, Stephen Shapiro, who is Professor of American Literature at the University of Warwick, where he's been a cherished member of the Department of English and Comparative Literary Studies since 1999. Before joining Warwick, Stephen Shapiro taught at Harvard University and at the New School, and prior to that he was a student, a doctoral student at the University of Birmingham's renowned Department of Cultural Studies. He also spent a period in Rome as a researcher at the Gramsci Institute, which very nicely prefigures our occasion tonight. Shapiro's research interests focus on the writing and culture of the United States, cultural studies, literary theory and Marxism, world systems analysis, urban and spatial studies, the sociology of religion, television studies, and critiques of mental disease. His numerous monographs include Pentecostal Modernism, Lovecraft, Los Angeles, and the World Systems Culture of 2017, the Culture and Commerce of the Early American Novel, Reading the Atlantic World System of 2008, How to Read Foucault's Discipline and Punish with Anne Schwann of 2011, How to Read Marx's Capital of 2008. He's also a founding member of the Warwick Research Collective and in this capacity has co-conceived and co-authored one of the most influential theoretical accounts of world literature in recent years combined and uneven development towards a new theory of world literature of 2015, which is a book that I and many others I'm sure swear by. Shapiro has held numerous distinguished honorary and visiting positions. I just mention a few here at the University of California's Humanities Research Institute, as a Fulbright Senior Scholar at the University of Saarland in Germany, as a visiting professor at the University of California, Irvine, and at the University of Edinburgh, where he was a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities. Most recently, he held a research fellowship at, the, at CAPAS, the University of Heidelberg's Kete Hamburger Center for Apocalyptic and Post-Apocalyptic Studies, where his work focused on disease data and the replacement of the individual, and is thanks to the science communication team at CAPAS that we know that his three big hopes for a post-apocalyptic society are decommodification, democratization, and the end to digital surveillance. Shapiro is extraordinarily rich, theoretically ambitious, and politically and intellectually imaginative and generous work, making him a key figure in debates about literary and material culture. He's currently working on a book entitled Working title, I think, The Cultural Fix, Marx, and the Organic Composition of Capital. And there's other ongoing projects, um, including the volume From Gothic to God, Horror in America, The Anti-Capitalist Foucault, and three co-edited volumes, all forthcoming, The Cambridge Companion to American Horror, Decolonizing the Undead, uh, Rethinking Zombies in World Literature, Culture and Media, and World Systems, World Literature, and World Ecology. When he's not working on these seven plus volumes, uh, he uh, is very happy to give lectures uh, such as the one that he's giving for us tonight. So we're very honored and happy to have him with us. And the title of Stephen Shapiro's lecture tonight is Gramsci's Anthropocene or Planning for the Apocalypse. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Shapiro. So I'm the guy holding you back from a glass of wine. Uh, this is um, uh, the Decolonizing the Undead and the American Horror Book are already out. Um, the Trekking Capital will come out in March. This is from work in progress, a different project called um, The Twist, Capital Data and the Intersectional Left. 
Um, I'd like to thank the scholars who spoke here uh, before me at this conference. I've learned a lot. I've taken a lot of screen grabs. My reading list is ready to go for the next few weeks. Um, the organizers of the conference and the team of that, and the British School of, at Rome for this elegant setting, and particularly the team behind um, the organization of the British School of Rome, the chap sitting in the front, the people who've been providing us uh, for this. I'd like to thank all of them for the opportunity to return to my Roman birthplace after an absence of more than 30 years. By, sorry, I realized that's just, by birthplace, I don't mean the accidental location of biological entry, but the site of my first real intellectual awareness, when after encouragement by, and with an introduction from Stuart Hall, I came to research at the Institute Gramsci, the old one on Via del Conservatorio. From that time comes everything I've written. It's a chord that's always played even if barely audible as a subtonic. To read Gramsci is always to reread Gramsci, especially given the enforced complexities of the prison notebooks written in incarceration and daily observed by censors. So let us begin by looking at this passage, which may well stand as an early statement about periodizing history by energy regimes. While Gramsci seems to discount an approach that has become more common, the passage dismissal is not exactly what it seems, since Gramsci is specifically writing against Laviosa's 1929 article in the Nueva Antologia, a journal that had been appropriated by the fascist regime by the time of Gramsci's composition. There, Laviosa discounts a discussion of petroleum extraction caused by the monopoly capital of Standard and Oil and Shell in favor of a quasi Nietzschean one of man's will and conflict against nature, a struggle that Lavusio describes favorably using uncritical metaphors of gendered sexual violence. Gramsci's passage on the Anthropocene can today be better paired with a scene from the 2019 Canal Plus TV show, The Collapse. The last episode, has environmental activists sneaking a climate scientist onto a political talks show so that he can confront a Macronist minister about the uselessness of technological fixes since so much of renewable energy depends upon non-renewable materials. Echoing recent collapsology claims, the scientist argues that it is now too late to forestall climate catastrophe and that we must instead establish nodes of survival mutuality for the now inevitable post-apocalypse. In a similar spirit, alternative life world writer Annalie Newitz, Newitz argues that human survival after climate collapse will be a matter of human dispersion, adaptation, and narration. Following recent claims by degrowth economists and anarchist anthropologists like James C. Scott and David Graeber, who argued that urban centralization was never as teleological as developmental economics claim, Newitz, however, adds the need for new cultural languages for us to survive our anthropogenic emergency. In this light, let me argue that the language of numerical limits the famous 1.5 degrees of IPCC reports will never suffice to either stop disaster or prepare us for its consequences because it fails to observe Gramsci's insistence that any po effective politics needs to be aware of its own historical conjuncture and epistemological conditions. The language of numbers, as I hope to persuade you today, belongs to an increasingly residual if not basically obsolete structure of cognitive and social organization. Similarly, we should also heed Fabian Drexler's claim in his Kappas lecture against an overly broad use of the term apocalypse. Drexler there argued that despite mass starvation in 18th century Japan, after the residue of volcanic eruptions destroyed the rice monocrop, there were no peasant rebellions or charismatic spiritual outbreaks because farmers valued the shogunate's end of civil wars in Japan. Thus, apocalyptic language only arises when crises of social reproduction and state legitimacy occur. Climate change alone is not sufficient to make a new cultural outlook. 
Similarly, the Jesus seminars of the 1980s and 90s, when a team of biblical scholars led by Robert Funk sought to establish what Jesus the Anointed actually said rather than late Pauline ascriptions. Funk and colleagues determined that there was no apocalyptic thought at all in a figure primarily concerned with demon exorcism, thaumaturgic healing by touch, and the refusal of purity codes of hygiene and diet. Indeed, Jesus seems to have consciously avoided becoming ensnared within the great theological dispute between Judean Sadducees and Pharisees over the question about the possible existence of an afterlife. The apocalyptic writings enshrined by later primitive Christians belong to a later crisis of Roman sovereignty, not one of Jesus's lifetime. In this light, I want to approach the question of language and the Anthropocene from a Warwick School perspective. The Warwick School consists of scholars in the British Four Nations and the Republic of Ireland who have or had an institutional relation to the University of Warwick. While the Frankfurt School worried about mass consumer culture through a fusion of Marx and Freud, the Birmingham School, which trained me, defended popular culture through a fusion of Marx and Gramsci and Foucault. The Warwick School, on the other hand, considers culture through the inequalities of the capitalist world system and reads Marx through Emmanuel Wallerstein and increasingly eco-critiques as well. Here, let us consider what world systems approaches call the secular trends of, that are 200 to 250 years long, a unit perhaps more popularly known through Fernand Bordel's term, the long duration. As Wallerstein argues, there have been two complete secular trends so far and were presumably in the early moments of a third. The first secular trend begins in the late 15th century with the emergence of Mediterranean capitalism and the spoilation of the new world. This trend ends with the late 18th century eras of revolutions. The ensuing second secular trend then runs according to Wallerstein until 1968, but for me, I date the end as the 2008 financial crisis. Looking at cultural history through the optics of secular trends has some immediate benefits. First, we can see that analogous moments in the trend overlayer and recall the conditions and the languages of earlier ones. If discussions of the climate crisis are often infused with calls for decolonization, this happens because the events of the first secular trend become vibrant as later secular trends align with similar moments and thus become infused by proximity with prior concerns. The start of a third secular trend, our current moment or the contemporary, thus draws on the concerns of the first with its conquistador capitalism and colonization of the new world. So therefore the rise of decolonization discourse isn't merely a woke fashion, but it is an intellectual consequence of temporal sim simultaneity over long durations. Secondly, the reason why each later secular trend recalls the events of earlier ones is that the results of one, of one stage the consequential crisis for the next or later ones. For example, because Europeans had no experience in large scale land management due to their feudal experiences in microstates, when they first came to the new world, they thought they saw an empty land, a terra nullius, because they could not conceptualize North American indigenous herding practices over hundreds of miles or South American Sweden, uh, that is to say slash and burn techniques of forest control. Europeans inability to see the labor of new world ecological niche sculpting meant that they did not understand how the catastrophic epidemics among the indigenous population after European contact resulted in a large scale loss of stewardship and led to uncontrolled forest growth. The growth of carbon sucking trees led to a global cooling experienced in Europe as the little ice age, a long phase of exceptionally cold winters that amplified the need for heating from carbon sources. So the first secular trend of capitalist reforestation in the new world led directly to deforestation in Europe 
as populations cut down uh, the forests and the ensuing need for petrocultural heating and agrarian industrialization in later secular trends. Because we need to look at the genesis of one secular trends, energy regimes and social reproduction as a resulting catalyst of prior ones, the best way to approach the languages of our own moment is to turn and review the manifestations of the prior second secular trend. That second secular trend begins in the wake of revolutions in America, France, and Haiti, and rebellions in Egypt, Ireland, and among the indigenous peoples of South America. These entangled uprisings produced two social truths. The first was the inevitability of constant and ongoing social transformation. The second was the inevitability of power shifting from a church-backed sovereign to more democratic and popular forms of government. Wallerstein argues that as a result of these two social, uh, two social truths, three political meta strategies, or what he calls ideologies, begin to respond to the facts of this modernity. The first to emerge was conservatism, exemplified by Burke and de Mestre, which sought to limit the effects of these truths through recourse to small groups deploying a language of organic community, tradition, established religion, and deferential common sense, and the use of state legislation against progressive social transformation. Through the 1840s, the last ideology of radicalism emerged. Unlike conservatives, radicals embraced these two social truths and sought to accelerate their arrival often by seeking to organize revolutionary sharp ruptures from the past. Rather than conservatism's celebration of the sovereignty of small groups, radicals favored the motion of the revolutionary mass collective. In between conservatism and radicalism, both chronologically and positionally lay centrist liberalism. Liberals acknowledged the force of these truths, but sought to regulate and control their tempo not least so that the dangerous classes would catalyze, wouldn't catalyze the anti-systemic forces that radicals sought to unleash. Liberalism's method of control was to gradually expand the voting franchise by allowing incremental inclusion within suffrage and access to higher education as the institution that would train and credentialize the technocratic managers of society. Of the three, centrist liberalism became so dominant that it often compelled conservatives and radicals alike to adopt many of its assumptions and tenets. Liberalism achieved this leading position because its proposed social strategies functioned better than the others to guide the capitalist world system through its intrinsic crises and the convulsions of the 19th century's nationalist and socialist movements. Liberalism succeeded as it forged a means to limit social demands for equality through its construction of a theoretical series of entangled binary divisions, such as the separation between public and private spheres, between the marketplace and civil society, and above all, between people awarded status as citizens and those consigned to social death as the objects of exchange through slavery, displacement, incarceration, the traffic in women, or proletarianization. The unit of analysis for liberalism was neither conservatism's small community nor radicalism's mass collective, but the atomized individual who was certified as able to represent themselves through the passage, through their passage through a set of disciplinary institutions like the university or experience and consumption of cultural technologies such as the novel. The novel was one of centrist liberalism's major cultural achievements, analogous to the construction of representative democracy, the appellate court system, or the penitentiary system. Today, we often assume all long fictions are novels because of the way this form so adeptly housed and reconfigured liberalism's division. The novel could on one hand promote public oriented national imaginaries and fictions of manifest destinies, while on the other simultaneously plumb the depths of privatizing desire by listening for signals of interiority. 
As liberalism promoted the self-enacting individual as the bulwark against the tyranny of the majority, the novel promoted the corresponding ideals of autonomous authors' unique genius and stylistic signatures. Such was the novel's success and dominance of liberal print culture that it managed to marginalize other forms of narrative, making them residual like the epic or pushing them into the social subordination of genre understood as the realm of paraliterature and pulp or lowbrow cultural production. But genre is better understood as writing that does not smoothly conform to novelistic liberalism rather than as a category defined by formal repetition or typological checklists. Today, yet, today, as the second secular trend begins to decline, all the cultural languages that were once dominant begin to lose their magnetic authority. The novel today, for instance, is now shaped by its nemesis through what's called the genre turn, wherein prestige writers adopt the paraliterature of supernatural fantasy and science fiction as a form better equipped to register and respond to the current moment. Similarly, those credentialized by the university to study liberal literature also begin to devote their intelligence to serious discussion of generic writing or new media forms like television, comic books, and video games. For many of those in today's audience, I see you. The foregrounding of genre also includes an awareness of genre. The foregrounding of genre at the moment also now allows us to look at genre retrospectively, to understand how genre functioned better in the past um, rather than the way it was pinioned into the corner. For the supernatural writing of gothic horror and weird fiction neatly aligns with Wallerstein's scheme so that we can say that the object of gothic is conservatism's fear of vanishing elites. The object of horror is the bleeding and traumatized body caught in the riptide between citizen subjectivity and the trauma of social death. The object of the weird is collectivized radicalism where the mass scale of the space opera, for instance, emblematizes a meta individual scale. Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock argues that the master tropes of these genres are spectrality, monstrosity, and apocalypse. Weinstein's point lets us also understand how the ghost of conservatism's vision contrasts to liberalism's obsession with the normal and monstrously deviant body, while radicalism's dreams of revolution are almost always apocalyptic in nature. It's worth noting, though, how many descriptions of the climate crisis almost always continue to hew to these motifs, so that the language of the second secular trend, unfortunately, as I will argue, still contours contemporary conversations about the climate. But to continue to use these older genres risks failing to realize that we in fact exist within a different emerging trend. Any tenable politics for our conjuncture should acknowledge that the trinity of conservatism, liberalism, and radicalism has become an emergent before an, an uh, has become residual before an emergent, if not now dominant, new one defined as the trinity of fascism, neoliberalism, and what I call the intersectional left. Conservatism has metamorphosized into fascism, liberalism into neoliberalism, and radicalism into the intersectional left. In a sense, to make arguments based on a receding episteme ignores the actual conjuncture of the contemporary moment is a strategy doomed to fail. And one such failure is the reliance on a particular kind of statistical mathematics that was once a truth formation expertly deployed by liberalism. The liberal apparatus buttressed buttressed its civilizational claims for gradual development by employing mechanistic and deterministic science and frequentist statistics to argue that social complexity could be expressed in predictable laws that were easily visualizable. Newtonian mechanics, mechanics posited that social systems were also linear and knowable through a causal deduction of universal operations. 
From an Enlightenment era claim that the world was a space of mechanistic determination came the use of frequentist statistics where a known input could be used to extrapolate outputs thanks to the creation of averages and idealized Gaussian distributions or what is often today called the bell curve. Liberalism used frequentist statistics to justify Quetelet's concept of the average man as a frequently nation status concept that would be useful to liberalism's evaluating managers seeking then to promulgate notions of the normal in contrast to the abnormal, the deviant, or to give it its proper name, Le Miserable. One of Foucault's core claims is that the deployment of numerical norms enabled the shift from the repressive power of the unseen regime sovereign to the productive power of disciplinary civil society. And that this turn worked in tandem with the rise of the pastoral state, which denounced prior sovereignty's assumed right to take life by replacing it with a biopolitics, where the so-called caring state sought to cultivate life and defend society against external and internal threats. Yet our own time is no longer one of the liberal biopolitical pastoral state, but instead a necropolitical one of carelessness, one that doesn't care about the confessional subject, but is a live and let die state, tolerant about the disposability of peoples, one that lacks concern about danger, lacks concern about risk for the population. It is a lack of care that is motivated by a neo-eugenics that assumes the privileged will always be protected, if not in fact liberated by the absence of all those deemed as non-excellent. And we see this neo-eugenics policy, especially with Anglophone COVID politics. This is a necropolitics that also allows for the disposability of the environment. And it's a form of power that is neither repressive nor productive, but what I call correlative, as it emerges from the algorithmic calculations empowered by new computational power and the use of mass data. Instead, the internet does not depend on frequentist statistics, but a different kind of mathematics, also emerging from the 18th century, residual but now become dominant, one that's called Bayesian probability, where the known input of frequentist statistics is no longer required, since these are replaced with an inferential probability of future occurrences based on past examples. Unlike frequentist statistics, Bayesian probability does not seek to create regularities, but looks instead to a constantly ongoing dynamic optimization that looks to develop better, but not necessarily always correct results. Furthermore, it has a greater aversion to what's called overfitting or trying to ensure that every data point or outlier, outlier can be explained within its formulas, which is the great problem of frequentist statistics. Instead, Bayesian probability has a greater tolerance for simply ignoring aberrant inputs so that good enough approximations are good enough. Here, disposability of data inputs conjoins with the necropolitical neoliberalism's comfort with the disposability of peoples. And we think, I, I think we saw this wonderful quote from Hayek in, in Peter's talk, and that's Hayek was basically operating from a Bayesian probability, critiquing the Keynesian liberal frequentist statistics, saying, you know, we can't look to make these kinds of rules and to make extrapolations based on the kind of these kinds of rules. So there's a sort of um, merger between neoliberalism and Bayesianism. But for climate activists, and those concerned about the climate, this turn from frequentist statistics that creates extrapolations into one of Bayesian probability that relies more on hunches may be one reason why the use of numeric thresholds like 1.5 degrees has no actual effect in changing public opinion. We can no longer have faith in the efficacy of terms uh, like statistical 1.5 degrees, because the social episteme on which they depend is receding. Here, it might be briefly worth briefly noting that the semiotic mechanism as a product also of the 20th century liberalism has been surpassed by algorithmic signals girded by Bayesian probability. 
The linguistic turn that motivated so much of the humanities in the last 50 years, whether it be it in its structuralist or post-structuralist guises, was based on a Saussurian binary claim that meaning is differential. Yet meaning today is constructed not because it is differential, but because it is correlative. And the semiotic models, which so many of us were trained and credentialized within, has decreasing efficacy to explain the realities of the contemporary moment. One example of this might be the replacement of the one example of this replacement of binary semiotics might be the rise in a rhetoric of non-binary or gender flux in recent discussions of sexuality and gender. Sometimes we feel students today are speaking a different language. That's because they literally are. They are products of this new emerging secular trend. We are products of a receding one. Now the threats of Bayesian capitalism are swiftly recognizable in predicative policing and surveillance labor control systems. But rather than rehearse its disempowering consequences, let me today instead explore what the Bayesian moment, what the Bayesian conjuncture might offer to the intersectional left. In this way, I want to end today by discussing contemporary tabletop role-playing games within a historic schemata. My interest is not to make a defensive argument for the value of these games against cultural condensation, uh, 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 cultural disrepair, um, uh, cultural disapproval. After all, it is the destiny of all new non-novelistic forms to suffer disapproval until a threshold event certifies their worthiness. Woody Allen's old joke that the streets of Los Angeles are so clean because they put all the trash on TV no longer made sense after The Sopranos became the hallmark of the rise of so-called prestige TV. Similarly, Mouse put, uh, Arch Spiegelman's Mouse put an end to the idea that comic books weren't worthy of serious study. Such status conversion, I wanna argue, will also be the case for tabletop role-playing games as yet another of the post-novel forms of communication, as these games help us register the presence of an emerging new cultural language that I wanna argue will ultimately be a better use in responding to the current climate crisis. Drawing on Adrian Herman's campus research, let me outline a very selective cultural history of games using Monopoly as a starting point. For despite progressive lawyer Clarence Darrow's motivation in creating the game as a warning against the rise of cartel capitalism or what Braverman would call monopoly capitalism, this 1935 game exemplifies Fordist era features as a mass produced object organized by predetermined rules of play that cannot be altered by the players. Monopoly is the kind of cultural in industrial production of leisure time that so disturbed Adorno. Gaming, however, changes in 1974 with the introduction of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, the first game to be considered a role-playing game. This fantasy role-playing game not only emerges amidst the oil shock of this 1973 and the ensuing crisis of Keynesian economics, it also participates in the rising culture of insurgent neoliberalism. Emerging out of war gaming, D&D rejects the distant bureaucracy of a pre-made game board in favor of a more entrepreneurial dungeon master's control of events. As an adventure fantasy of dungeon delving by characters primarily known through the racial identity, D&D invokes a subterranean geography of a failed state in ruins, a vision of decay that is often aligned with the period's racist anti-urbanism, often depicted as Gotham City in need of a brutal new form of capitalism, one dependent upon neoliberal, neoliberal Batman's extra state, state of exceptional intervention. D&D presents a life world that's imagined largely as simply consisting of zones of lucrative extraction where encounters of indigenous ethnic others are overwhelmingly meant to be resolved through combat. In D&D, the only good orc is a dead orc. One is never encouraged to consider civil interaction with others, just a constant series of melees run by many-sided dice, 
themselves artifacts of petrol culture. D&D thus exemplifies the contradictory practice of neoliberal deregulation with its freedom from older board games, one that operates through a mechanism that actually, in, that in function, in, re, in reality, actually functions as a re-regulation with D&D's later pro proliferation of revenue generating manuals. So it begins as a deregulation, suddenly becomes like a series of constant manuals very long Baroque manuals that you have to buy. If Dungeons and Dragons arises through insurgent neoliberalism from the 1970s onwards, the crash of 2008 enables a radical transformation in culture with a new gaming par paradigm initiated by the married couple Vincent and McGay Baker with Apocalypse World in 2010. Set within a, a post-catastrophe life world, apocalypse world has several substantive cultural achievements. First, it majorly breaks from wargaming's competition to create games as opportunities for collective narrative making. The game master is reconceptualized as one whose role it is to encourage conversation among the players rather than conversation as in D&D &D, with the dungeon master as a charismatic holder of truth. Secondly, Apocalypse World emerges from an anti-corporate realm of working class precarity and a search for feminist agency based on McGay Baker's work as a public school sex education teacher. Designed to be run by those with little time or money for unusual dice or hardback manuals, and here Adobe's 2008 release of the PDF as non-proprietary software is technologically significant. So no, that's a major shift is that the PDFs used to have to pay for 2008, Adobe makes them free and that massively changes the medium of cultural production because people who can't afford printing costs, small run micro printing costs can now afford to circulate um, these games. Apocalypse World not only just requires two six-sided dice that the bakers argued could be purchased cheaply at most convenience stores, any 7-Eleven, rather than searching out for a Baroque uh, game store uh, for D&D's manuals, but it also radically simplifies dice roll results. So beyond seeking egalitarianizing conversation as its purpose, Apocalypse World also introduces a Bayesian logic. Dungeons and Dragons binary win-lose dice results are left behind as Apocalypse World introduces a Bayesian logic that classifies dice roll results as success, fail, or in a seven to nine roll, success with consequences. And because the seven to nine roll is the most common result of two six-sided dice rolls, it means that the game mainly guides players into the consideration of consequences that cannot be linearly extrapolated. Lastly, Apocalypse World gives up IP control by allowing its game mechanics to be used by other designers for free. Inspired by the Bakers, Canadian trans game designer Avery Alder then created Monster Hearts, first in 2012, but it's mainly known through its 2017 second version, Monster Hearts 2. As a means of exploring non-straight desire, Monster Hearts asks this player to choose a skin, a character based on the cinematic genre of US high school types, a nerd, a mean girl, a jock, etc. But these types are also experiencing a hidden identity as a cinematic monster, a werewolf, a vampire, and so on. In this way, Monster Hearts goes beyond Apocalypse World as it explicitly looks to create an intersectional left in three main ways. First, it exemplifies the critique of liberalism's disciplinary construction of normality and medicalized observation as the real monster. As the TV adaption of Station Eleven says, to the monsters, we're the monsters. The big move in genre fiction is no longer the fear of monstrosity, but the recognition that the real monster is liberalism's normality. Second, because one, not, one does not simply play a character in Monster Hearts, but you play a character that is itself playing a character, a jock struggling to come out publicly as a demonized monster, Alder deploys a means of formal distancing in the service of what is called deprotagonization. 
which is an attempt to break the possessive individualism of player identification with their character as an idealized avatar of themselves. So unlike Dungeons and Dragons, where you fall in love with a character as a sort of form of narcissism, the idea behind Monster World is you can't do this because you're playing a character who playing a character. So the char first character might fall in love with their second character, but you as the player, that liberal agent is constantly put, pushed to the background. Alder claims that while the function of the novel is to explore interiority and the function of a motion picture is to explore action, somewhat normalized definitions of this. But anyway, let me just leave it at that. Alder's notion is the novel's function is interiority. A motion picture is to explore action. A tabletop role-playing game is meant to explore the process of decision-making and the consequences of decision-making. Alder's motivation of this character's dual envelope is thus to create the conditions for the move beyond monocultural identity politics towards the construction of an intersectional left where empathy is necessary but never a sufficient gesture to the building of a new counter hegemony. In this way, Alder quotes Bial's reminder that the theater isn't revolutionary, instead it is a preparation for the revolution. As Alder explains in her answer to a question asked by a cis female at last year's Ropecom in Norway, the question being, is it okay for a straight person to play a queer character? And similar questions, Chris Bivy, who is the Black American uh, creator of Harlem Unbound and Haunted West. Also, the question, is it okay if you're a white player to play a Black, black character? Alder responds to this question by the audience, remember, first by reminding the questioner that role-playing games can function as they did for herself as a means of coming out to self-awareness. But if that is in play for the questioner, uh, very archly says, if you don't happen to be a lesbian by some odd uh, exam uh, chance, um, it's still useful. Um, because the more important question is to use the game to come away with more questions than answers. Questions that will need further inquiry with the actual subjects who bear and are nominated by these identities. Yet as critically aware as is Monster Hearts, a greater achievement in my mind, and perhaps this is the threshold game, is Alder's 2013 game paired with Benjamin Rosenbaum's 2018 game, published now together in the same book, Dream Askew, Dream Apart. These games link a catastrophic world with an 18th century East European shtetl, and that pairing too is interesting to me as of analogous moments of the different secular trends, the contemporary with the beginning, the contemporary beginning of the third secular trend with an imagination of the beginning of the second secular trend. Dream Apart, Dream Askew has two significant uh, advances that illustrates why Alder herself believes it's her greatest career achievement. First, it abandons the term post-apocalypse for, for the phrase community and strife. Because as Alder explains, and this is a quote, usually when someone says post-apocalyptic, we imagine a really tough guy in leather with spikes and guns. One thinks of Mad Max. Um, and Alder says, Instead, she wants to have discussions about everyone else. It's what we do together with the limited resources we have, with the limited time we have, when the rest of the world has fallen away from us. Secondly, Dream Apart and Dream Askew revises the old anarchist slogan, no gods, no masters, with a new game mechanic of no dice, no masters. It's a game that does not have any dice determinations whatsoever. The dice are are abandoned, where the players collectively decide what they think the alternative, the outcomes might be. Again, that sort of Bayesianism based on past experience. And there was no moderator, no dungeon master, no game master. The players as a collective decide how the game's going to start, how it's going to go, and what are the uh, uh, what's the endings. Gameplay is collectively is conducted collectively, where everyone decides what ought to be the outcomes of their choices. Dream Apart, Dream Askew thus doesn't categorize itself as so-called powered by the apocalypse, which is the name given to games which take their mechanics from the bakers, but instead has created a new rubric called belonger, belonging outside belonging. It's a set of games designed to enact how marginalized groups establish their own communities 
outside of the negative forces of a dominant culture, even if these groups have a precarious and vulnerable quality to them. Here, we can momentarily cast our eyes back to the master tropes of the second secular trend as a way of seeing the emerging replacement, replacement master tropes of the third secular trend, which I argue were our extinction as a feature of fascism, technofix as a feature of neoliberalism, and what I've called speculative nostalgia as the form of narratives that pair historical trauma with alternative life world imaginaries, or to use Avery's language, narratives of strife amidst the collapse that seek to establish enclaves as places to live, sleep, and hopefully heal. Such rehearsals might provide the language necessary to enable the project of survival called for by the climate scientist in the collapse. This may also give us an idea of what Gramsci might have said needs to be done in our own Anthropocene emergency. I think Gramsci's answer to the, climate, to the problem of climate crisis could have been easily said. I think Gramsci's answer could have been easily said in a single word. And I think for Gramsci, the simple answer would have been what we always knew was always his intention, teaching us that that single word answer is simply this, the communism. Thank you. Stephen. Absolutely. Brilliant. Or denunciations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there is a microphone, I think, somewhere. And we open up to the more people posting questions on. Can I hear one thing? And then. Um, I can't see the question, so you'll have no, to see really the We have a system in place for so reading the mm. um, so, Oh, there's a question from Monica over there. Let's start with you. I think, I don't know whether the Q&A is going to be recorded. I don't think it's, but people can watch it from home now. So don't hear. People are watching online, so don't hear. But, uh, yeah. But, Okay. 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 So uh, I think this is working. So thanks, uh, thanks very much, Stephen, for a really dizzying talk with lots of different ideas. And I just something that has, uh, stood out to me that I just want to focus on, and that is your distinction between, you know, had at some point uh, toward the end the uh, kind of tripart distinction between uh, identity associated with a novel and action associated with, I forget what the, what action was associated with. Movie, pic moving pictures. Moving cinema, pictures, yeah. cinema. That's Alder's distinction, cinema. not mine. Cinema, okay. And then decision-making as these, this new generation of, of games. Yes, of this new So this of... is very interesting because, I mean, I, I, I must say that I'm speaking as somebody who really doesn't like games and never plays games, but I think you're kind of, um, talking about it this way has made it to me a little bit more interesting because I see how deliberation and decision making gives a, a new new a kind of pragmatic access to identity beyond the binary of identity which is always static and being who you are as opposed to doing something and deliberation and 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 sort of decision making is really the moment where your values come into play you have your you exercise your judgment and that in the moment before you take action, because the action itself may always go wrong, it may always, you know, like the, the you know, unintended consequences and things like that. But I think the moment of decision making and liberation is kind of the moment of immersed, you know, like where people are immersed in certain situations, embodied, and are actually um, kind of accountable for all sorts of things that sometimes don't come into view when you just talk about identity in the abstract. So I'm really intrigued about that and I was wondering whether you can in what I see is that that there's maybe an an, emph an emphasis on ethics and on on accountability in this that um maybe there and I'm again I'm speaking somebody who has no idea about you know in these games maybe and I, I'm just my question I guess is 
whether this is this I'm I'm onto something here or whether I'm just speculating and just <laughs> going in sort of off in the wrong direction. So more ethical, you know, like the moment of a specific judgment, you know, like what I'm associating with this is my current obsession. I sort of this is kind of disclosure, phronesis in the Aristotelian sense, which is practical knowledge on what to do, what to do next. Um, this is a specific. Um, kind of intelligence that people need in social context uh, when they decide what to do or not to do. And you have to be smart. You can't just be good as a good person, but you have to be smart in this way. And I was wondering whether computer games are actually kind of exercising this sort of this idea of phronesis uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you are onto something. You are, that's a very uh, smart and, and apt description of the project that they're going uh, that the games are trying to do computer games are slightly have been the distinction between analog tabletop games and computer games have been slightly muddled because of covid so the games that were never meant to be seen through a digital interface now because of covid uh have 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 the do but there was a great emphasis on physical physical proximity and uh and relationships. So many of these games begin with the description of um, things you should cook for the game, and you know, care breaks, and a discussion of um, uh, what's called X cards, things that you rather not be discussed, things you absolutely don't want to be discussed. They've got a cinematic language of you know, black. If the conversation goes in a certain way, some can just say like, "Listen, I don't want to. I don't want it, this game to go that way." And so that's all a little bit harder in the computer games, but they're not meant to be digital very specifically because these games are meant to be pay, uh, played by people who do not have the financial resources for that a computer game would require for the most part. And they're not meant to put people in the position of debt purchasing, right? So the manuals, because they're PDFs, most people get these through piracy to be quite honest. And they're just passed on like in the old ways. Of, of doing something. But what I think the question, and I, I should say that Alder's undergraduate degree is in labor studies. So none of this is, is naive. Um, Alder, in my opinion, is one of the great intellectuals of the contemporary moment and is very aware of what she's doing um, because of a, you know, the education of this. And I think this responds to the two great questions that Eurocommunism in the 20th century asked. And there were very, every Euro communist, no matter whether it's Adorno or anyone else, is always attempting to answer these two questions. It's the problematic that makes sense of the variation of, of the left within Europe and the left elsewhere. And the first question is why did the revolution take place in Russia where it wasn't supposed to because it wasn't highly industrialized? The second German edition of Capital Marx ends with a paragraph saying the revolution's happening in England and they take that out. <laughs> So most people don't know that paragraph is how capital ends uh, because that didn't go. So the first question is why did it happen in Russian? And the second question, which is Gramsci's lifelong project is why didn't it happen anywhere else, right? Why didn't it, it, it expand? Why, why not Italy? And the whole project of the prison notebooks is why did we lose, right? And everything in the prison notebooks and the Kurgini is an attempt to ask that question, uh, a question about crushing defeat in the most mortal instance. Um, and I think what these games are doing is very interestingly, they're moving away from a fantasy of a Marxism of the party to a Marxism of the everyday to ask that question about learning from the defeat, the trauma and the humiliation that most of us on the left or the new forms of left experience either historically because we come from a blasted history or in the current moment because of prejudice um, that's going on. Um, and one of the interesting things that I'd mention in, in Apocalypse World is unlike Dungeons and Dragons, where you gain experience points, you advance higher based on your ability to kill a dragon or to kill anyone that doesn't look like yourself. In, a, in Monster Hearts and in a, uh, a Dream Apart and Dream Askew, you gain experience points only when you try to do something and fail. So experience is understood through failure, never through neoliberal success, never through neoliberal competition. And so what I think is interesting about this is an, it's an attempt to imagine a kind of post-1989, you know, post-Soviet socialist left, which acknowledges the truth of experience, which is that most people on this left 
um, you know, ex uh, know a life, you know, of, of blasted dreams. And what do we do about that? And how do we move forward? And furthermore, that kind of experience of blasted dreams is probably the best thing we can learn to adapt to the climate crisis, which has already happened, right? So in other words, for all those people who may not particularly be concerned with progressive history are facing a crisis. And it's an attempt to build what Gramsci would call a block, not a class, but a block, different groups coming together. Um, and I think these games are actually, in my estimation, having been taught this by Kappus, um, the cutting edge of the most interesting kind of cultural transformation and experimentation today. Doesn't mean that it's the only one, but I think this is one of the first and it's worthwhile noting and thinking about um, the project. Okay. Um, I have a couple of, of quick questions, which I, I might sort of slot in as, as you, you keep thinking about things to, to ask. So um, I guess one question is, um, spec does speculative nostalgia, speculative nostalgia strikes me as an extremely powerful concept. And I'm just wondering, for you, does it exist? Is it specifically connected to this medium? that you described, or could you have um, an algorithm-based game which is online and is producing that kind of juxtaposition of worlds, or could you have it in a in a film or in a novel? Yeah. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask is sort of how important it is um, for your analysis, how many people play these games? Uh, okay, let me take the second one uh, first and then I can go to the first one. So the second question is no. It, it, it doesn't matter because for me, what's interesting about it is bubblings of opportunities. And so many of the, so I would like to persuade you that you can all learn something about these games, even if you never actually play them. Um, although you should probably play them, but you know, so in other words, cultural transformation does not occur when it becomes a mass movement. It can occur by the accumulation. I'm, let me, sorry, this was a very, I've stumbled into what I should have said. I draw my argument from Michael Denning's argument on the cultural front, where Mark uh, Denning argues that the 1930s cultural front is formed by three groups that have very different origins and very different numbers. On one hand are the groups of black Americans and second generation ethnic immigrants who are very numerically large and they want to demand equality. Then there's a small group of largely New Northeast New England elite educated university artists, which we call the modernists, who are unhappy about the cultural conservatism of America, right? They're, they don't have to worry about getting a foot in the door because they are the door or their families are the door. And then he says there's a group of internationals, largely people fleeing from the Nazis and the fascists who come. And that, so we have a very large group that doesn't have access to cultural resources or likes these new mediums. We've got a, a second group, the modernists, who have access to cultural institutions, but is actually numerically very small. They've got a lot of cultural capital, but very small. And then we've got an even smaller group who actually have access to cultural capital, but there aren't many around. And their goal is they're trying to say to Americans, listen, you should pay attention to what's happening over there. And so Denning's argument is that these three groups of differing sizes form a kind of toolkit. I've made an argument that there's a similar kind of toolkit today. And so for me, it's not necessary that this become a mass movement, but it, it's, it's part of what I think will be not a structuralist, but a sort of ensemble of familiarity that will be a part of it. So to me, it doesn't matter if as many people play these games as play monopolies. The first question, which I've now forgotten, which- Oh, I was just curious whether it's connected to this- Oh, yes. So for me, no, the speculative nostalgia is a term for me, which I think is found in every non-novelistic new media form. So you find it in comic books. Yeah. I've written about this with my favorite thing is Monsters, Emile Ferris's, which is about the trauma of a Latinx 13-year-old uh, lesbian or Lovecraft country, which investigates the Tulsa massacre with this world, you know, science fiction, time travel, Afrofuturist trend. And I think what you get very much is this fusion of the uh, uh, trauma of indigenous extermination, transatlantic slavery with a sort of sci-fi or al al alternative fuse. So that's not limited to these games. I feel that's a new cultural language which is developed in everything but the novel or these older uh, consecrated traditional forms. So the novel is out. The novel's out. The novel's dead, baby. Okay, any comments on that? Any questions? 
that's accepted. Okay, the oh, yes. is have on to why. Yeah, there is a question over there. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. So I was very curious by your concept of the intersectional left. I was wondering if you could speak briefly more about that, how you qualified who you see as being mm -hmm. represented in that. And especially if you see that as a global category, because clearly I see in your description when you take us from the second secular movement to the third secular um, strand, no, sorry, what do you call trend. it? Trend. Clearly we go from a very Western centric phenomenon to more global phenomena. So th there's also this shift kind of, so, and I'm particularly interested in this category of the intersectional left, just to hear more about it. Thank you. Yes, that's, thank you for asking that question because that's a part of the argument, which I left out because I didn't want to, you know, run the risk of going over. So the intersect, intersectionality is a concept which largely emerges from black American feminism as an attempt to exp explain the differentials of mod modalities of oppression that a single individual can experience to be a woman and to be black. Right. For me, that's I, I acknowledge that classic definition, but that's not how I'm using it, in, because for me, that definition is still based at the level of the individual. So it's still this is this example of how the terms of liberalism are so powerful that they manage to magnetize even oppositional thought. So it's the level of the individual that's go, that's going on. For me, the intersectional left is a collective term and it's a term about coalition politics, not allyship, right? But it, because every, you know, which is a slightly different concept, which is more based on an older charity model. Um, uh, but what used to be called fellow travelers, right? That notion of uh, different kinds of groups can come together and, and begin to accept the damages done to one as damages done to everybody. And so that I think is the sort of mode of a sort of a new emerging politics that will bring together the North and the South as well, because it allows each of these groups to maintain their own experience, but also to become recognizable by others. And that's why I, I put Alder's suggestion, which is, should I play a lesbian character? And she says, well, that's gonna, you discover you're a lesbian, but if by some like really inexplicable reason, you don't happen to be a lesbian, um, you'll begin to ask questions. And so that's Alder's, that's the purpose of Alder's game, uh, of, of, of the game, which is to get one group to think about what the other group is without saying, without appropriating authentic, a knowledge of authenticity. So the claim is you can't, if you're a straight player, you can never understand a queer life. You just can't because there's a basic, but that doesn't mean that you can't take queer life world seriously as something you want to consider it the same way. And so when I talk about the intersectional left, that's that's how I mean it. I don't mean it at the level of the individual, but the mean of a conglomerated and had internally heterogeneous collective. Yes. Hang on, I have to get yeah, through to you. Incredibly informative, and uh, but I'm also extremely disoriented, also because I work on the novel as a genre, and so it's like, should I throw myself in the Tiber now or wait until tomorrow morning? But other than that, I'm very curious, I'm very ignorant of games like my colleague here, but I wanted to know something about the role playing in Bridgerton, for example. It, where, I'm sorry, what? Bridgerton. It's a TV series oh, that yes. is now very popular yeah. in Italy. And you have role playing of uh, uh, characters who are not exactly white, et cetera. And so if we think like you were explaining, we would have a form of essentialism reborn because you can never understand what a white character is doing and vice versa. So I don't know how you apply this notion. And then I wanted to go back also to the other chart about that she was talking about the intersectional left, but I was curious about fascism and extinction um, because there is also a pamphlet in Italy that came out a while ago uh, by Carla Benedetti, literature will save us from extinction. So um, I'm curious. 
Okay. I don't know if my questions are too stupid, but no, know. no, no. They were absolutely uh, clear, absolutely brilliant questions. So the first thing I would say is you don't have to stop studying and the novel. You just have to stop using the category of the novel to study these long fictions. And so that means you have to approach these texts from a different uh, perspective, which is probably not going to be one of hermeneutics and probably not going to be one of semiotics. But it doesn't mean we're not going to stop reading, you know, fill in the blank. We're just not going to read them in the way that you and I probably were trained to read um, their books. So it's a different category and a different sort of handling of that. And I think we, well, I'll just leave it at that. The second question, which is about, um, essentialism. I don't believe that this is a return to essentialism, because for me, this is the sort of the Bayesianism, the left Bayesianism of this, which is that one works on hunches. And if you have a hunch about somebody else, it means that you probably no longer have certainty of yourself either. So for instance, you know, one of the critiques about Eurocentrism that is often heard is this, this notion that even, okay, first of all, Europe is like, there's no there, there, right? We all know that Europe is a constellation of power inequalities, but you know, nobody wakes up and receives Europe, European high culture as their birthright, right? You don't wake up and you, you know, think like, oh, well, I know Beethoven. You know Beethoven, but through an instantiation of institutional uh, educations, right? You know. Um, so, you know, European culture is as foreign to Europeans as it is to non-Europeans. It's just that Europeans have all these apparatuses and all these institutions telling them that actually they are somehow know Beethoven or Bach, which, you know, are worth listening to. But, you know, I'm not saying don't listen to them, but it's nobody's heritage. We all have to learn this stuff. But, you know, there's a, just an, a, an inequality of things like that. Um, I'm very glad you asked the last question, because in my opinion, that's the most controversial thing that I said in this lecture, and I was sort of secretly hoping to slip it in. But um, uh, so I'll just put it out there. We can argue about this over wine, but I think the language of extinction has no place within the left. Um, and um, I was briefly a member of Extinction Rebellion uh, for my you know, for good or bad. And uh, one of the reasons I left, but I think extinction is is it almost inevitably magnetized by eugenics um, and a sort of uh, a, a sort of notion of preservation of purity of race. So, you know, Hayek's more controversial thing is if you have a national health service, Auschwitz is around the door. For me, the rhetoric of extinction and animal extinction inevitably is a, a, is a return to a far right. When I was, when I first, not when I first came, but very early on in the 90s, I had a Fulbright professorship in Saarbrücken in the Saar region I love um, for many reasons. But every day I walked past a poster that said, my friend, the tree is dead. It was about acid rain, you know? And I, I, I felt like vomiting after every, every day I saw that poster because I was like, to me, as an American Jew, what that poster, you know, it's like that's it's like the movie where you put on the glasses and you can see like obey. To me, what that poster was really, what, what it should have said is my friend, Mrs. Cohen or Mrs. Levy is dead, but we're not going to say that. We're going to say the tree is dead. And I, I think there's something in, inherently unsatisfactory and in fact dangerous about the language of extinction in the way that it's deployed today. Um, and I know that's a controversial statement. So I'm just going to put it out there. But I think that the left should avoid that language of extinction because it implies always a purity, a, a blood and soil purity behind it. And, you know, maybe that's because that's where I come from. But I, I just do not think that's the way to go forward. Uh, yeah, we've got a question over there. Sorry, it's long. We can't throw this. Well, thank you so much for the talk, Steve. Uh, I, I want to follow up on something that Florian said. You said, okay, I mean, this is to the to the question. I mean, how many people are actually playing the this these games? I mean, that's not important. So, uh, however, I would say, I mean, this is if I understand you right, you're talking about something that's I would say is emergent. No, I mean, mm -hmm. this is so, but still, I mean, this is what what I fail to see. Or but maybe you can help me with this. I mean, uh, what is the the 
in Foucauldian terms, what would be the dispositives? I mean, for 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 this emergence. I mean, I, I I'm actually. I mean, this is what you described before. I mean, isn't it that this is sort of the, this this becoming is actually swallowed up by the very logic of the algorithm? I mean, we we have that sort of thing. I mean, this is everybody goes on the internet. The the matrix out there knows already what we want. So I mean, isn't this the sort of isn't this an illusion of decision? The possibility of making decisions. Yeah, these are great. These are all the things that I didn't want to talk about. You, you, you put the thumb on it. Okay, so the dispositive, as I understand Foucault's definition, is the um, triage or trinity of uh, a managerial um, a specialist using a material architecture to deploy examinatory uh, knowledge or truth statements. In other words, this right you know um that notion that theoretical notion of the depositive of the apparatus is itself Foucault's own embedment within the logics of the second secular trend right Foucault's entire career is based upon you know an investigation of the dispositive and the examination is both a mechanism of visualization often through tab statistical enumeration and decision normal abnormal I do not believe, and, and you know, as as much as I have spent my entire life reading, I think I have actually read more Foucault than I've read Marx or Gramsci. I think that's probably the writer who I've read almost everything uh, from. And so I have a big, you know, I put a lot of time in that. But I do not believe that as useful as Foucault's theoretical investigations were, I do believe they are based within a 1970s and that they are of decreasing efficacy in the current moment. And in, embedded with that is the notion of the dispositive, because the dispositive is basically a creature of liberal centrism. If you take the argument that liberal centralism is no longer the case, that it's been formed by neoliberalism, it means that there is something else there, which we do not, or at least I do not have a name for, but it will be something else. Partly that something else will not operate in the way of the dispositive because the university is the great apparatus, the university state complex. And as we know, well, okay, another controversial statement. We no longer exist within Haboltian research university. That is gone with something else. I don't know, you can call it the edu factory. I'm on industrial strike. I know many of you are on industrial strike. And what's been seen is the cynicism of naked power where our, our entire careers, we were told that the, these re regulations that had to be maintained, marking procedures, examination boards, and so on. And, and, and this has all been thrown out. It's been shown that the, the new system doesn't actually care. It's based on tuition fees. So there's going to be something, and I think that might be the market or the internet or Facebook or Twitter, but I don't think that Foucault's terminology is is that helpful? And one of the encouragements of this talk is to say, we're not in a biopolitical age. We got to stop talking about biopolitics or trying to fit contemporary experience into biopolitics. We have to stop looking at the current moment and say, that's the apparatus. They're not, it's not the apparatus, it's something else. I don't have a language for that. Let's all figure out what that language may be. That may be a generational problematic as it were. Um, Will it be incorporated by the marketplace? You know, Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau uh, once said, never do anything that requires you to buy a new set of clothes, right? And, um, you know, which is pretty good. And so we all know that there are these things which require absolutely no purchasing whatsoever. Mindfulness, neo-Buddhist meditation, right? <laughs> Sit down, do it, yoga, right? Um, these games, which there's no IP control over, that the, the, all these designers give these free. We know that there are all sorts of things which actually don't require any form of purchasing. And yet there are these huge corporate life world manifestations where, you know, and I'm, I do it as well, buying my expensive, you know, Manduka yoga mat or whatever, you know. So corporations are always going to be there to exploit this kinds of activity. But I think we have to hold on to the firm the idea which I really liked about which I really like about the bakers, which is they designed a game. Uh, they come from a working class Mormon background, and they just uh, that's to say where you know the, the the parent and I come from where Mormon the Mormon religion was founded. 
So I grew up along among many Latter Day Saints, and you know, and so they don't do many things. But one of the things they don't do is they don't give allowances to their children, right? It's a slightly strange. So this is a kind of activity in which you know your parents weren't going to give you money. They certainly weren't going to let you go to the cinema, among other things. So what do you do? What kind of culture do you make? You make a kind of culture where you don't need anything, right? And maybe the dice comes from the fact that Howard Hughes employed LDS to run the casino to get the mob out of them. And so, you know, there might be something in the back because they're from the Midwest. Um, and so you can always buy expensive stuff, but I do think there is a culture that this part of this will be hard to appropriate by corporate culture because you just don't need to do, you don't need to spend money to do it, you know? And I think that if people encourage each other not to spend money, you start to get a culture of, of free, a, a, a culture of free culture, as it were. So is that a risk? Yeah, obviously we live in this massively, you know, Frederick Jameson once said, postmodern is the condition when capitalism has infiltrated every single aspect of life in the 1980s. If that was true, can we go back to that? Like the 1980s looked like a pretty great time for me. So like if, if the to totalization of capitalist experience was the world Fred lived in the 1980s, sign me up for it. We live in a massively, you know, like capitalism found lots of other ways to, you know, infiltrate everything. So the space seems narrower and narrower. And so the problem is, is to find cracks in the system and to start enlarging them. It's a risk. There are no guarantees. These are games that are precisely about, you know, to use, to put all words that a Avery wouldn't say, but it's a Marxism without guarantees. Is this going to work? Who knows? but we must do something. Thank you. Any, any last questions? If not, maybe we can certainly all say that we were here on the evening of the 21st of June in the British School at Rome when the revolution started. The rehearsal, <laughs> the rehearsal. The rehearsal, and um, thank you very much uh, for being here and many, many thanks to Stephen Shapiro. <laughs>